Are you wired for sound now? All right, there we go. It's a new year, it's a new battery, so. And so, in the, the spirit of the season, it is the season of reminiscence and remembrance and reflection over the past year and even the past decade. So I know many of you took the decade challenge and posted pictures from 2009, 2010, up until today. But over the past few weeks, you've seen numerous lists and articles, videos documenting the past year and the last decade of the tens, of the teens, of the best and worst movies, the best and worst music, the best and worst sports teams, the major happenings in politics, pop culture, and natural and man-made disasters. And so the past decade was full of triumph and tragedy, of celebration and chaos, political intrigue and pop celebrity gossip. I don't know which is your take, but they were all there for the taking. And most of what has happened, though, you've already forgotten about. And so I could go through a list of all the stuff, and you're like, who is that? What did they do? Oh, I forgot about that. Because now we've turned to a new decade and a new year. And so my email box and social media feeds are now filled with prognostications, predictions, and trends of what is to come. So things from like uh, my mortgage company predicting growth in the housing market and how I should refinance because they want more of my money. Or you have Outside Magazine tell me what health and fitness trends that I should look for because I turn 40 in the next decade, so I guess I get all of these things saying, hey, you need to get it together. And so now I've got ESPN analysis telling me who's going to win the World Series and the Super Bowl in 25 or 2025. And so how they can predict all this stuff in the future, I don't know. But they're telling us how to prepare and, more importantly, how to flourish in this new era. So what do the roaring 20s bring to us? So the question's like, Is the economy continue to be healthy? Are there going to be autonomous and flying cars? Which I'm for both. I'm also for sending men to Mars. Um, And if you didn't know, there's an election coming up in 2020, and there's a lot of people telling us how that's going to go. And the ever-important question, will Tennessee football continue to be mediocre in the next coming years? (laughs) These questions we are all concerned about. But I think more importantly, we're concerned about things more personally. How will our families grow? What new job opportunities might come along? Will we stay healthy? And how do we as Christians and as a church navigate and live in this new decade, in this brave new world? How do we flourish and thrive as the people of God today? Because we live in uncertain days. I don't care how many emails you get about what's to come or the trends that's going to happen or the predictions that will be made, but most of them will prove to be false. Because the people of God cannot follow the wisdom and logic of the world. We have to look different as the people of God. We are a peculiar people. We stand out. So you cannot go to BuzzFeed and get 25 life-hacking tips to flourish and thrive in this new decade. That may tell you what to buy on Amazon that may work for you next week, but it won't tell you how to live your life under the Word of God. And so we have to go back to the metric and to the rule that rules all rules. And that is Scripture itself. And so we're going to dive back deep into the Old Testament today in the book of Deuteronomy and look at Moses' instruction to the children of Israel as they stand at the brink of the promised land. And so these words can give us guidance even today. A lot of times we just kind of sweep the Old Testament away, but God still speaks boldly and clearly through His Word even in Deuteronomy. And so you may get advice from a financial firm or from an Instagram influencer or some other two-bit celebrity, but those things will disappear, and you will forget about them by Thursday. But the Word of God remains. So let's go to that Word now. So Moses, through the Holy Spirit, says this in Deuteronomy 6, starting in verse 1. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules, that the Lord your God commended me to teach you that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and commandments which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in the land flowing with milk and honey." Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, 
and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. And so when we drop into a passage of Scripture like this, which is not our normal diet of Scripture, we kind of parachute into a paragraph, we have to step back for a second to see what is happening before, during, and after this paragraph. Because no piece of Scripture stands alone. They are all linked together. We have to understand the context of what's happening here, because these verses are written to a specific people at a certain place in a particular time for a distinctive reason. These paragraphs may be familiar to you, but we often forget where they stand in the narrative of Scripture. And so if we're reading through the narrative of Scripture, we've seen the people of Israel come out of Egypt through the ten plagues that God sent on Egypt, through the Red Sea. So miraculously, God parts the waters and they walk through on dry ground. They wander the wilderness and they come to the Mount of Sinai where God gives them the law and the Ten Commandments. They have met God on the mountain, and then proceeded north to go and claim the land that God has promised them, that we saw in verse 3. The land flowing with milk and honey. But initially, remember, the people of God refused to go into the promised land. They fear the people of the land, because they seem, oh, we're like grasshoppers in their sight. They fear the people and forget to trust God. Therefore, they've wandered the desert for 40 years, waiting for an entire generation to die before they can return to the promised land here in Deuteronomy. And so now in Deuteronomy, they stand at the eastern edge of the Jordan River, ready to go back into the land that God has promised to them hundreds of years before. Promised to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. So the book of Deuteronomy itself serves two purposes. It's a recap of what's gone on in Israel's history up until this point. So if you want a recap of the Old Testament for the first five books, read the first few chapters of Deuteronomy this week. You kind of get an overview of what's happened, how they've failed God, and how God remains faithful to them. This book is a record of Moses' sermons and teaching of how the people are to conduct themselves in this new place, in this new life, in this new era. And so God has given Moses and the people instructions of how to flourish and thrive. So Deuteronomy 6 lands squarely in the middle of these general instructions to the people showing how they should live and flourish in a brave new world. But what about us? What does it mean for us to come to Deuteronomy this morning and to look to see? What does it mean for us to look and live in this new decade, in this new year? How do we live and flourish not in a land that flows with milk and honey, but in a land that seems like a wilderness exile? God's word here is clear, and he gives us four encouragements, four instructions for how we, we are to behave as God's people as we carry out his word, as we honor God, and as we flourish in our lives under him. And so we come to these four encouragements, and we see, first of all, in verses three and verses four, the command to hear or to listen. So Moses is telling us to listen with care. Listen carefully. And this is a command not just to a certain person, but to a people. This is the Lord, our God. This command to all the people of Israel and all of us. And so this is a community flourishing. It's not just to certain people here and there. It's to all of us together. So we're moving into this new life, this new era, together as one. And this command to hear is repeated often. And I think it's repeated because like your children or like your spouse or like yourself, you have to be reminded over and over and over again. Because I know when you tell your children to do something once, they go ahead and immediately do it, right? I guess not. We have to repeat these things to our children. We have to repeat these things to ourselves. And this is what Moses is saying. Listen, take care. And this listening is not just a passive listening. It's a listening with the idea of putting what you've heard into action. Because how many times have you ever said to your children again, are you listening to me? And they're saying, yes, we're listening to you, but we're not going to do what you tell me to. I hear you to take the trash out, but I'm not going to take the trash out. But Moses is saying we listen and we obey. And this command is always, it's a reactive response. It's not proactive. We listen because God has spoken. Just like in physics, for every action, there's a reaction Our reaction is to listen. So what is the action? 
What comes in verse 4, where Moses puts forth the most famous tenet of Judaism and of Christianity. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. There is one God, and we serve him alone. This is the God who reigns above all their so-called gods, because they aren't gods at all. We serve God alone because all other idols and gods and worldviews are entirely and completely worthless. There is only one true and living God, and he deserves and demands our attention and our obedience. Therefore, our reaction is to listen and to obey to this response from God, that we see God's character here, we see God's promises here, and we see God's actions here. We just take this paragraph or these, this chapter, we see, first of all, the character of God, that this is the, the one and true living God. He's the maker of heaven and earth. He stands alone without lack of, or without any need, without any lack, because he is holy and altogether perfect. He's merciful and gracious. He's slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. And above all, especially in Deuteronomy, he is seen as the faithful God who promises and sees that it comes to pass. This is a God worth listening to and obeying just because of who he is. This is a God who has spoken. It's a God who is there and a God who is not silent. He has spoken to his people and given them a covenant promise. Look at these two uh, verses later on in the chapter, in verse 10 and verse 18. God's promises to his people here are, The Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you. And you shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that, he, that it may go well with you, and that you may go in and take possession of the good land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers. This is a promise that was made hundreds of years in the past. And God reiterates and repeats that promise over and over and over again. And he's bringing it to fulfillment. God's promise remains. And so you see the people standing at the edge of the promised land, ready to go in and take the promise that God has given. God is a faithful God who swore an oath and will bring it to pass. And so God has promised to deliver his people. <coughs> Sorry, it's the lovely time of the year where everybody gets the gunk. <clears throat> Oh, pray that my voice will hold out for us. Because we know God has acted in the past. We know that God will act in the future. And so God is working for his people to bring them into the promised land. And so they have faith in a God who has spoken and a God who will deliver. And so they have seen that God has worked before and they know that God will work in the future. And so we see that God has brought out a people to bring them into the land. <clears throat> Look down at verse 22. And so we trust this promise of God by looking at what he's already done. But listen to this promise in verse 22. The Lord has brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord showed signs and wonders, great and grievous, against Egypt and against Pharaoh and all of his household before our eyes. And he brought us out from there that he may bring us in and give us the land that he swore to our fathers. And that phrase is very peculiar. It's very interesting because God just doesn't bring them out of Egypt to leave them in the wilderness. He brings them out of Egypt through the wilderness into the promised land. And so in our story, we still live in the wilderness. We still live in the desert. We have not reached our promised land. We have not crossed our Jordan yet. That comes in our death. And so God has spoken to the people of Israel as they are moving into the promised land. He's speaking to us as we're going towards the promised land. Because, yes, we see God working in Egypt. We see God working in the wilderness. We see God working in Canaan. But how is God working for us? What's well, great news for the people in Deuteronomy, you know, several thousand years ago. But what about me today on January the 5th, 2020? Is this God still faithful? Does this God provide and deliver today? Yes. The gospel of Christ delivers us not from physical slavery or a cruel taskmaster, but from the greatest tyrant of all. Satan holds the power of death over us because we are bound to sin. God's nature demands perfect righteousness from us, something that we cannot deliver. 
we stand and sit under the penalty and curse of this very law that Moses has given. The requirement that Moses sets out here in Deuteronomy, none of us can fulfill it. It shows and reveals our sin, our inability to keep it, and the future death that awaits its penalty. But for God, who will one day, from this point in Deuteronomy, again in his perfect timing, will send a prophet like Moses, but one greater than Moses, to deliver not from Pharaoh in Egypt, but from Satan, sin, and death itself. This is the promise that we celebrated at Christmas when Jesus comes to be born of a virgin, to live the perfect life, fulfilling and keeping every commandment that we could not, to die in our place. Jesus betrayed, tried, beaten, and crucified, not for his transgression, but for ours. He, the innocent man, standing condemned as a wretched sinner in our place, takes the wrath and punishment of God for us. He hangs on the cross, absorbing that wrath of God that we deserved, exchanging his perfect righteousness for our filthy rags. This is what God has done through the cross, through the resurrection. He's delivered us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. So we now, as the people of God, have been liberated from Egypt. He has brought us out in order to lead us in. We have a future and a hope. Death was arrested And we have now a new life to move forward as Christians. And so we might not have walked across a dry seabed, but we have come out of a watery grave and stand firm on the promises of God and the new life that he gives us. So we must listen to this God who has spoken, who has delivered, and who promises a life to come. Because his actions don't stop after he saves us. We can point back, oh yes, God saved me on October the 13th of 1996, or whatever date you want to put on that. But God continually is to save us today. Time would not allow us to go around the room to see how God has acted and moved on behalf of you, his people. And don't forget that God will continue to act and move on on behalf of his great name and his people from this day forth forevermore. So this is a God worth listening to. So in this new era, the application for us is to position ourselves well, to listen well, to listen closely, because you don't hear by accident. This is why Moses over and over again says, take care, take care, don't forget, remember, listen, hear. Don't neglect your duty to listen and obey the Lord. So as we apply this today, I encourage you to prioritize your mornings. Sit under the word of God. Let it read to you. I was reading an autobiography by a missionary in the South Seas of the Pacific, and he was transcribing the scriptures into the native language of that island. And one of the native chiefs came out and says to the missionary, he says, how do you, how do you understand this? Because he couldn't read. He didn't understand that words on the page could be interpreted. And so he says, this book speaks to me. He goes, missionary, teacher, pastor, teach me and make me see how this book can speak to me. He wants to listen to the word of God. And so this missionary goes through and he interprets and he translates the whole um, New Testament into the native language. So that chief, that heathen, that pagan can worship God because the word speaks to him. Just like the word speaks to us today. So prioritize your mornings and sit under the word of God before you do anything else. And so we need to inundate ourselves with reading scripture, to sitting under sermons, to having conversations about the word. So we position ourselves to hear the word from each other, from scripture itself. Surround yourselves with the word of God. In this new year, make it a priority to learn and know God's word. And listen well. But this is not just a passive listening. This is a listening that doesn't go in one ear and out the other. It's a listening that must be put into practice. So Moses is saying we listen with care, but we also obey and follow in love. Because Moses is saying that we need to listen to hear this and to do it so that we can take care to do what is right and good so it will go well with us and God will be glorified. But we come to the Old Testament a lot of times, Deuteronomy and the law specifically, and say, this is the law. 
We, we don't do the law. We're not under the law anymore. We don't, get, we don't have to eat those things or stay away from those things. But we have to be careful. It says, well, we're not legalists. We don't have a list. We're not checking it twice. And we often just throw the whole thing out in one swoop. But we have to understand that obedience to God's commands are not optional. Obedience to God's commands are still a requirement for Christians. But they come from a different motivation. They come with a different application. And so God is telling us here that we have a new motivation to obey God's law. Because we could have one of three motivations to obey. First of all, we could obey to placate an angry, capricious, and bitter God. Like we're going to obey out of fear of destruction. Like he's going to strike us down with some lightning bolt from on high. Or we could say, well, I'm going to obey to earn God's favor. To be good enough or to be righteous enough that God will bless and save me. But if we know our Bibles, neither of those two are accurate. Neither of those two are valid. Because God is, yes, a God of wrath, but he is a God of mercy, of grace, and of long suffering. He is not looking to strike us down with every misstep. And we know Ephesians 2 because it is by grace we have been saved, through faith, not of works. And so we don't obey because God's going to strike us down. We don't obey to earn God's favor. but We obey out of love. To exhibit and display an affection and love for God who has already saved us and delivered us. We obey not to earn favor, but because we have favor. We want to bless God out of our love. He loves us, and we love him, and in that love is obedience. Don't believe me? Listen to Jesus in John chapter 14. Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. Obedience comes out of love. And so the verse 5 in Deuteronomy says that we are to love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our might. Jesus says that's the greatest commandment, to love God with everything that we have. And we love in obedience. And so we listen to God's word, we apply God's word to our lives. And so the application for us is pretty simple. If you read a command in the Bible, do it. Practice what it says. So let's walk through uh, a scenario. Say you come to April, and we all know April is famous for taxes. And so we all love doing our taxes, right? And I'll take that as a no. And so you're reading through the Bible in April, and you come to Deuteronomy chapter 5, and you come to verse 19, it says, Thou shalt not steal. Okay, doing my taxes, thou shalt not steal. Don't fudge the numbers on your taxes. Pay what is due. And as you pay, trust God for provision. Okay? And you pay that, and you're like, well, I don't have any more money in the bank because I gave it all to the government. Caesar took all my change. And you come to Philippians chapter 4, and it says, Do not be anxious, but by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, bring your request to God. Okay? April paid my taxes. May I have no more money. God, I'm anxious. I'm not going to be able to eat. Pay the bills. What do we do? We bring everything to God in prayer. We lay our burdens down. A few more weeks go by, and then you come to Ephesians chapter 4, and it says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving others as Christ has forgiven you. So you read that a couple weeks later, and you've paid your taxes, you're anxious about what's going to happen, and the auditor shows up in July. <laughs> Be kind to one another, tenderhearted. God, are you sure kindness to this guy? But we see God's word applies to our lives every day. And we could take scenario after scenario, but when we come to it, do what it says because that's how we flourish under God's rule. We trust God. We bring everything to him. And we love as God has loved us. And so you may not be blessed with material prosperity. This is not do this and get this big reward, but it's do this and, grant, and get God's favor because we look to God's reward not this world's. So we listen and we obey, but how do we get to the point of obeying this word? Because too often, yeah, we'll read this, and oh, I remember, do not steal, but I don't remember what comes in any other part of the Bible sometimes. So we can get bits and pieces here and there, but how do we get to the point of obeying instantly? Well, Moses gives us the answer here in verse 6. 
It says, And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. These words are on our hearts. When you wake up in the middle of the night, what is on your mind? What is on your heart? And too often when I am awoken by whatever means in the middle of the night, it is not on God's word. And so over the past year or so, when those things pop up, where I've got this problem with this, and I've got this, and I've got to pray for this, and I know this person's in the hospital, and this is going to happen, and all these things are popping in my mind, I have consciously started to turn my head and start to pray and to bring those requests to God and say, God, I can't deal with any of this, especially at 2.30 in the morning. And so what has started to happen is that I, as I reflect on God's word, I begin to internalize God's word, that it stirs up into my heart in the middle of the night that God's word begins to creep up and to overtake those anxious thoughts. And so when Moses says that we are to commend and to, or that we are commanded that these laws should be on our hearts, we need to internalize God's word with discipline, which is another word that we really don't like. Discipline. And so when God says that we are to remember, to keep, to do, we do that by letting it get into our soul, to be ingrained in our hearts and our minds. Because we do not wander into holiness or righteousness or sanctification. There is an effort here. And we don't like effort. You know, we can think of a lot of discipline. A lot of times we think of physical activity. And so you can see these arms, I have not worked hard for these arms, so don't be jealous. These are thinking man's arms, and I hate working out because I don't have any discipline. But so much of the time that works into our physical lives, but also our spiritual lives. And so in Psalm chapter 119, the longest chapter of the Bible is devoted to God's word. He says this, this is David, he says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wonder for your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I have stored up your word in my heart. So as we apply this into the new era, we must make a practice of the habits of grace. Habit. Daily taking into the word. Sitting in prayer coming to church on a regular basis, fellowship with Christians. This is God's means of grace to us. And so I meet with several um, UTC students throughout the semester, and one of the guys asked me a couple weeks ago, how do you know all of this? Talking about the Bible. And he'd asked me some random question, and I knew the answer to it. And I says, well, it's not that I've studied this week. It's that I've studied over a lifetime. And so I got to thinking about it after they asked me that and says, I have been reading consistently the Bible since college, which is almost 20 years ago. And God has used that daily application of the word, that regular reading and thinking and praying to build me up to where I am today. And I'm not saying that I'm anything special. It's just that I've spent time doing that. And I told this guy, like I tell you, it says, you have to start somewhere. Think about your life when you are 40. You're 20 now, but when you are 40, what kind of man of God will you be? Think of all the times and all the studies and all the scripture that you can take in in 20 years. And I'm not saying you've got to spend years and years of study. You've got to take time every day, 15, 20, 30 minutes, 60 minutes. This builds up and God brings that to bear over time. We must marinate in the word. And so if you've ever grilled out and you've taken some meat, taken some steak, or chicken, and you've put it into a marinade, and you leave it there for a long time, and that seeps into the meat, just like the word should seep into our soul. You are immersing yourself in something. What are you marinating in? Is it social media? Is it sports? Is it the word of God? So God is telling us that we must internalize the word by sitting in it, by listening to it repetitively, to make it a habit of grace. Not a habit of works, but a habit of grace. And so to truly thrive in this new era, remember this is a communal event. This is not just for us individual. We listen with our own ears. You can't listen for somebody else. Wives, you know that to be true. 
And so we can't listen to somebody else, for somebody else. We can't obey for somebody else. We can't internalize for somebody else. We do that on our own. But lastly, Moses is saying this can't stay inside. It's got to go outward. And so to really flourish, we need and we want the whole community to grow together. So we must repeat these words to others. And so we listen on our own. We study and we sit under God's word. And then we share that with other people. In verse 7, actually, let's go ahead and read verses 7 through 9 again because we've probably forgotten them, because God says to repeat these things. Let's repeat them. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down and when you rise. <clears throat> you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. <clears throat> and so Moses here is telling the people to teach, primarily Fathers and mothers, teach your children and your children's children. He mentions fathers, sons, and grandsons earlier in the chapter. And this word teach here is closely connected with repeat or remember or to rehearse. Teaching is what all parents do. Parent, teaching is what all leaders do, what all supervisors do. As we can't teach and learn themselves, First of all, if we don't know this ourselves. So whatever we know, we pass on to others, whether for the good or the bad. And we do this all the time, right? If you're working on your car, you're going to teach your children how to do things. Hopefully, to change tire, to check oil, to do something that you know how to do, you pass that on to others. If you know how to cook, you're going to teach your children how to cook. But how do we teach? Specifically, how do we teach the Word of God? And notice here that he talks about it in several different ways. He says in verse 6, it says, When you sit and when you walk, in activity and inactivity. He says, When you lie down and when you rise, in the evening and in the morning. So we teach, first of all, we teach continually. This is in every place, at every time. We're always learning, we're always teaching. And this is a conscious decision to teach our children to teach those younger than us. And so this is like teaching around the dinner table or in the car, sitting, moving. We don't walk a whole lot of places anymore, but we drive a whole lot of places. And I know when I was a campus minister, I felt like uh, a single dad of about, a parent of about mm, 13 college-age boys. And we had a minivan, and it was awesome and awful. Because if you've ever been in a minivan full of 20-year-old boys, you know that that is not a pleasant smell. And so we would, we would go places and we would have what they termed man ventures. And so we would be <clears throat> hiking and traveling and uh, searching for waterfalls and swimming and all these other things. And we would have all these strange conversations in the van. And I'm driving, half the time I'm listening to these guys just kind of yak back and forth. But then they would randomly ask me things. I remember driving over a mountain, this one guy goes, hey, what is Calvinism? Uh, we'll talk about that later, son. And then sometimes it would just be like, hey, um, I've got this problem with a teacher. What do you think I should do about it? Or I remember walking one day, and we're literally lost in the woods, and this guy and I just got on the conversation of how he should <clears throat> break up with his girlfriend. And so there's a lot of nuance in that. But we can see that God is using all of these random conversations to build character into me and into them as we bring the Word of God to bear. And so this happens in your household as well. You sit and eat with your family. You drive with your family. And you can have some really awkward conversations in a car really easy because you don't have to make eye contact. And so sitting across the dinner table, you got to look at the person you're talking to. But if you're sitting with your 13-year-old son talking about other things, you don't have to look at them, but you can talk to them. And so what Moses is saying that we are to teach at every place, at every time, in designated times of devotion, and in teachable moments in life. And so we teach continually, but we also teach persistently. He says, teach diligently, repetitively. Over and over and over again. And so if you've ever sculpted, which I have not, but if you've ever seen like Mount Rushmore, you know, to carve something into stone, you can do it really quickly with a hammer and a chisel, 
or you can do it a long period of time by just continually rubbing or dropping water on it. And so the Grand Canyon was not carved instantly, it's carved over time. And so if we think about a, a rock, and so Moses is etching the words of God into a stone, he hammers it out. But think about your life. You know, we can teach a lesson real quick, or we can slowly apply it over time, year after year, month after month, day after day. And this is the image that, that Moses is telling us to do, is to comp- completely give ourselves to teach and to disciple others. So we teach continually and persistently, but where are we to teach? And it's pretty clear from Deuteronomy that we teach primarily in the home. Mothers and fathers to children. And so this means we need to have some kind of plan for family worship. To gather the family together, to read the Bible, to pray, even to sing together. But it's prioritizing our life around Scripture. My daughter is starting to learn that we hold hands during prayer, and she sometimes just reaches out. I'm like, hey, she's getting it because she's seen this for the past year and a half. And we think about what we're ingraining to my 15-month-old child now will come to bear later on in life. And so we need to prioritize our life around Scripture. And also, we need to prioritize your involvement in the church. And so children are watching you, parents, to see how you react to the church? How do you talk about it? How do you devote your life to it? Do you get up early in the morning? Is it optional? Children do not wander into maturity, and they do not wander into church. Parents, through the scripture, are given the instruction to be the primary disciplers of their own children. And so the home should be the primary and central gymnasium for Christian growth. And this is especially given to us as dads. Fathers, take the lead. This command is to parents, but to fathers in particular, to teach, to lead, and to guide. It doesn't mean you have to do everything. Sometimes that means, hey, family, come together. Your mother's going to read scripture. Your mother's going to lead a devotional. We pray as fathers. We lead as fathers. We study as fathers. And so primarily this discipleship, this repeating of the word of God happens in the home. But it also happens in the church, because the church is a family. It's a family of families. This command is not just to families here in Deuteronomy, it's to the whole nation, just like it is to the whole church. Paul acted as a mother and a father to the churches in the New Testament. So older adults, older, more mature Christians, there are younger adults and youth and students and children who need your example, who need your wisdom. Because as a young adult... Especially in my 20s, I was an idiot. And sometimes I'm still an idiot, and I need you to correct me. Thank you, Gene. (laughs) So, older adults, take the initiative and reach out to help someone, to disciple someone. Because when I was in my 20s, I didn't live anywhere close to my parents. I could call them, but it was a whole lot easier to to call somebody in the church, hey, I need this, I need help with this, do you have a recommendation for that? And so younger adults, especially students, need you older adults to correct them, to instruct them, because a lot of them don't have life skills. They don't have spiritual skills. They need you just like you need them. And I encourage you, just like parents, to take the initiative to have someone over to your house. Get to know them. Become a spiritual parent to them. So this command to repeat and to teach goes to families in particular, but also to the whole church together. But as we close, I want to address three objections that some of you may have. The first objection may be a little out there for some of you, but this happens all the time, and I've seen it so much. So the objection goes something like this. It says, I want my children to be open-minded when it comes to religion. I don't want to force my opinion on them. Uh, They need to explore their own options and make their own decision. Which, on one hand, that's, that's right, because they have to own their own faith. But leaving your child to just wander off on their own to seek after their own religion, what goes against Scripture, 
So go back to point one and two of this message. Listen and obey the word of God and teach your children. This is not an option for Christians. Because not teaching them about God, to choosing to ignore that, to let them go their own way, is teaching them something about God. He's not important. Uh, He's just there to to strike us down. He's just there to uh, not give us a good time. He's not, some, he's not worth bothering about. Don't worry about him. Or if we don't teach our children about the church, if it's unimportant, if it's not a priority, eh, you can manage on your own. You don't need that. You don't need God. You don't need religion. Just you, you figure it out on your own. That's the idea that's prevalent in so much of our culture today. It says, well, I can you know, bring them to church if they want to go. We can, we can pray if we feel like it. We can read scripture at Christmas time. But your children are being discipled by something and someone. What will it be? What is shaping the hearts and minds of your children? Over the Christmas break, I read a a random article in the Wall Street Journal, which I'm not, uh, that's not my habit, but my father-in-law gave me this. I said, this is very interesting. I want you to look at it. And so the article is called The Generation Gap Over Church at Christmas. And it was talking about older adult children coming back home for Christmas and not going to church with their parents. And this quote in this uh, article got my attention, and this is on the screen. And this dad says this. He says, we raised our daughters to be independent thinkers. We just never expected them to think differently than we do. It was a shock when our three youngest stopped going to church in high school and college. What did you expect, dad? We just never expected them to think differently than we did. We just thought it'd just rub off by osmosis. But reading this article, this guy had no involvement in church. He probably wasn't a Christian, even though he labeled himself as one. Something is shaping the hearts and minds of our children. What is it? Is it the Word of God? Is it the church? Or is it life? And also to this objection, well, you discipline and you disciple your children in other areas, because I see your social media feeds as you go to sports practices, and as you go on vacations. And it's not unloving to teach your child that the earth is round. Oh, I want them to have an open mind. So if they want to believe the earth is flat, they can believe the earth is flat. You know, the square root of 49 is 12. No problem. You don't teach your children that. You instruct them in truth. The earth is round. The square root of 49 is 7. God's word is important. Not teaching them about Jesus and the gospel is possibly the most unloving and cruel thing you can do for your children. Withholding the gospel deprives them of what they need the most. So listen and obey and teach the word. Which leads into the second objection of, well, I, I just don't, I don't know enough. And that's valid to a point. But you know some things. So teach what you know. And like any first-year college professor, you may not know a whole lot more than your students but you can stay one day or one lesson ahead of the rest of them. I remember um, to get myself through seminary, I um, tutored students. And I had this one student who was with me through pre-cal, calculus, and beyond. And I didn't know anything beyond. <clears throat> and so I said, if I, I know up until this point, but you want me to help you here, I've got to learn how to go here. And I stayed a week ahead of him. And I failed a lot of the times, but every few nights I'm like, whoa, never knew that. That's kind of cool. But we learn as we go. And so as you learn, you teach. And this is perhaps one of the greatest motivations for you to keep learning, keep studying, and keep reading, keep listening. Because the more you read, hear, and learn, the more you can teach others. And the last one, which is probably the most common, oh, we don't have time or space for this discipleship thing. Where are you spending your time? Because you can skip around from practice to games to school activities. Do all of these other extracurricular activities and things. But we don't have time for the word of God. Or how many episodes of The Office did you watch this week? I discovered that there is a, an app on your iPhone that comes standard called Screen Time. And if you want a heart and gut check, turn that on. And it tells you app by app how many minutes you spent on your phone during the past week. And I turned it on for the past three days and saw some of the times that I spent on stuff. I was like, this is worthless stuff. 
And so I know that there are seasons in life where discipleship and study and reading together is difficult, like with a small infant at home, or if your, na- if your life is a teacher and things happen and, you know, all these activities come about. And there are seasons in life, but there's always something in life that's going to take priority. How do we prioritize discipleship with our own children? And we're not talking about hours upon hours every day or every week. We're just talking about minutes and time together. Because we can scroll through Instagram for 20 minutes and it goes by like that. And we can't give three minutes or 30 minutes to the reading of God's Word. What are we missing if we don't disciple and repeat these things to our children and to one another? And so when we come to Deuteronomy, it gives us these encouragements, not as a, oh, I'm such a terrible Christian. But it's a reminder that you are going through the wilderness and you need help to flourish, to thrive, and to grow. Because he says at the end of chapter 6, it says these statutes that the Lord has commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as we are this day. Your spiritual life hangs in the balance, and it's this habit of grace, prioritizing and listening to the word of God, obeying it, internalizing it, repeating it. Colossians 3, chapter 16 says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. So let this be an encouragement to us to study, to listen, to obey, and to teach. And let us flourish as people, as families, and as a church in these coming days. Because these days will not be easy. So as we move forward into this new year, I urge you to take hold of the good and to allow God to bless you in your reading and your studying as you become more like Him, and more importantly, as you Know him and love him more. Let's pray together.